young Paul Whitehead, a visual artist, um, a painter primarily, although I've made movies and I do graphic design. Primarily I'm a painter, so that's the way that I express myself. The ideas I have, that's the means I use to express it. But I like to dabble, I like to dabble in other things. I've been dabbling in film myself just recently, which is fascinating. For a while, for about five years, I was in the, in the Guinness Book of Records for the largest mural in the world, which I did on a hotel in Vegas. Not there anymore, it's demolished. <laughs> and that went on for quite a while. In, in, in the middle of all, they're still doing record covers. <laughs> I had a show, I had an art show in London. Um, at that time I was doing a very complicated pen and ink drawing. Very, very detailed. I like doing that and, and watercolour mixed together. And a couple of people saw it, their producer saw it and he told Peter Gabriel and Peter Gabriel went to see the show and and that was, we hooked up and we just connected, you know, they, they had a very good, very sort of almost classical musical sense and I had my world and their world and they didn't have any visual knowledge. So initially I just, I went to the library and got a ton of books to show them. You know, you can do this, or you can do this and introduce them to different artists, you know. So that was, that was really good collaboration. The first cover was a, a cover called Trespass. Um, and what they did, they gave me the music that they'd written already, you know, just basically on a guitar and the the words, the first sort of take on the words. And I looked at it all, it was all very romantic. It wasn't really rock and roll, it was kind of romantic, which my style was appropriate for, right? So I thought, okay, so I gave them the idea that, you know, it was a king and queen. They were looking out of the window of their castle and Cupid was behind them, peeking from behind the curtain, about to ambush them, right? That was perfect, great idea. So I started painting it, and it was a rectangular, you know, two by one format record cover, right? So I started on the right side and I started working across. I got halfway across and I got a phone call. And it was Peter Gaber and he said, uh, it's not gonna work, the idea isn't gonna work. We've written another song and it doesn't work. So I said, well, what's, what's the deal? He said, it's kind of a violent song. It's different to all the other songs and it's called The Knife, and it's about a knife that was possessed, you know. So he sent me the words, and I, I looked at the music, listened to the music, and uh, it was like, yeah, it's right. But I'd done a lot of work, <laughs> and I wasn't gonna throw it away, right? And it's very soft, it's pen and ink with watercolour, you know, and I wasn't going to throw it away. So I, I tried to come up with some idea that I could utilise the half-finished image on the cover and violate it some way, destroy it, burn it, whatever. So it was, it was in, in, in league with like the new track, The Knife, right? And um, I was going to spill ink on it, burn it. Then I came up with the idea of slashing it. And they agreed, but they didn't believe I was going to do the, the actual slashing. So we had like a, a get together in the studio and I took a razor blade. I rented a prop knife, a little knife that the Scottish guys wear down their sock. You know those little tiny knives they use? I slashed the canvas with the razor blade and stuck the knife in it. And that was, that was the first collaboration. And I think it was that, that combination of 
not being phased by the fact that they wanted to change it. I was more creative about it, you know. Other guys would have just said, no way, no way, you know. I said, okay, well, you know, let's, let's make it work. I, I enjoy female company more than male company, invariably. I think I've got a lot more female friends than male friends. And that went to the next level. Of course, in, in the, those days, clothing was, was more androgynous, you know. I used to wear frilly shirts and velvet suits and the hair was long, so it wasn't like it is nowadays. It was like it was okay to wear shoes with a little heel on them and stuff like that. You know, nobody really freaked out. And I sort of, yeah, I got interested in that. Initially, it was on a sort of a, a secretive, sort of sexual sort of way. You know, kept it to myself. And occasionally, I meet a, a girl, and I'd sort of say, hey, you know, I'm, I'm into sort of doing this, and she'd say, oh, that's interesting. And I'm, I'm a little different because I'm, I'm not trying to be a woman. You know, I'm not interested in trying to be a woman. I don't even like trying to fool people that I'm a woman. What I say is I, I like to manifest the most positive aspect of that female energy that I recognize in me, in, in the way I can to the world, which is totally different to going out there and trying to pass yourself off as, as a girl. You know? I pass myself off as Trisha which is another aspect of, of Paul, somewhat different. And in fact, I've, I've counseled quite a few guys. A lot of guys are going through what I went through 20 years ago, you know, um, shame, you know, the whole social thing, what if, you know. When I paint, it's very complicated and very, um, you know, I work it all out. Like I said earlier, I, I, I don't start until I've really got the idea figured out. I can see it's going to work, you know, so that involves draftsmanship and perspective and all those sort of things, you know. And then the painting comes and invariably it takes, I would say, you know, maybe a fast painting would, would take a week. Some of them take a month, you know, of sitting there every day. The way Trisha creates, it's very spontaneous in the moment. And in fact, I say if it takes more than 20 to 30 minutes, it's too much. I don't want to be able to see the human hand, you know. If it's overpainted, you can start to say, oh yeah, that was painted. So it's very healthy. I mean, uh, and I've also been told it's, it's very apropos to the two genders. You know, the male being very analytical and contrived and so on, and the female more emotional and spontaneous, which is not something I intended. It just worked out that way. <laughs> yeah, I was raised Christian, Church of England, you know. I was a choir boy. I was an altar boy. I was, you know, very involved in it. And I was, I always remember there was one day, I, I must have been about nine, nine or ten or something, and they'd done communion, and I was always fascinated. I mean, I don't know whether you know anything about that whole thing, but it's supposedly a transformation takes place. You know, you take this wine, and you take this bread, and it gets changed into the body and the blood of Jesus, right? And I'm sort of like, like four or five feet away from the priest, right? And it's like being with a magician, and you're trying to go, I'm gonna watch and see when it changes, right? <laughs> Did I? No, it didn't change, but supposedly it did, right? I was always mystified by that. And then one day, at the end of the service, we were back in, in the vestry, you know, the back of the church, and I saw him chugging down the wine. <laughs> he was like knocking that, that sacred wine that had just been changed into the, the blood of Jesus. I was like... <laughs> I don't know, it's just, everybody has to find their own way, obviously, but... I think as you, as you go through life, you learn that there are certain truths that you can't transgress, you know. Like truth, you know, think, the old cliches, you know, love, truth, all these things. I, I hate deceit, deception, you know, and it gets you nowhere. And I think you also 
you've got to see yourself in context of the big picture, you know. Everything affects everything else. It's all very kind of hippie, you know, hippie thoughts. <laughs> and karma, big believer in karma. Yeah. And you see that working. And it's, it's a law that can't be changed, bent, twisted or anything. It's, what do you call it? Um, there's a word for it. It's a, an unbendable law. And yeah, a lot of people don't believe it. A lot of people don't believe in reincarnation. Definitely don't believe in that. And I think it's kind of, for me, Christianity has got some of the bits, but not all the bits, you know. You start to look into the Buddhism and Hinduism. You, if you take all three of those, Christianity, Hinduism, Buddhism, you've got the perfect code to live. You've got everything there in different degrees, you know. The Hindus go way over the top. They have a God for everything, everything and anything. So everything's taken care of, right? The Buddhists are more cerebral, you know, but peaceful. That's, that's the most important thing about them. And I, that's what I find interesting, that blending of the Western and, and the Oriental. Somewhere in there is, is the truth. And everybody's truth is different.